at you Oh my brother You are going through times of difficulty I know sometimes you feel all alone Call me anytime when you feel all the way down oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين In the name of Allah the compassion of the merciful all praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet Muhammad his family and his followers all until the day of resurrection let me welcome every one of you today to the new episode of Meet Your Advisor here on Huda TV and of course every Friday at 9 p.m. Mecca time we are meeting and of course Today's topic for me is very significant because I do have this concern of those who are part of our society, but yet we need to look after them. And these are the disadvantaged people who do not have enough to go by in life as we have studied in economics, for example, we have the haves and the have-nots. We have those people who do have enough supply, enough provision, enough things in life to go by. But there are also people who are on poverty level, maybe below poverty, and they are still in need, either because they cannot work or because they work but still that's not enough for them to go by in life. So they need to work, they need to earn their living um, with the, all the work that they can do, but still they cannot get enough to meet their needs. They may have big families, they probably have uh, children or some members of the family who are ill and who need medicine, maybe they cannot have enough for renting, they don't have enough for all the daily needs they need to buy and rent and to pay their own uh, bills and so on and so forth, uh, let alone other things that may not be uh, necessary, such as extra things for travel, for uh, enjoyment and so on and so forth. Yet, I think we need to look after those people who are in need those who, probably not only that, but that's part of the people who are in need of financial help. Those who are in need of clothing, uh, medicine, uh, supplies, needs for their own house uh, tools and so on and so forth. Yet, there are people who are in need of other things. People who are in need of compassion, of care. People who are in need of intercession. Maybe people who need, uh, those who have the ability to put forward their own cause or something that they are after, and they cannot reach their own target except through somebody who can intervene for them, who can be a mediator. And of course, that is important. Also, there are people who go astray in life. They need our advice. They need our care, they need a nice word, a supportive word, a word of warning, a word of, um, hey, opening your own eyes to something that you need to be looking after, something that you need to be aware of. All of these are things that come under a very big title, which is tafrijul kurubat, to make hardships easier for people to ease up things that people may have or face. I know that we know that our, we ourselves are in need of others, but the need may vary from one person to another, from one family to another, from one society to another, from one nation to another. Look at the nations that are going through hardships nowadays. They need our support. They need us to look after their own 
medical needs, after their own financial needs, after their own uh, supplies and, and food and, 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 and so on and so forth. All of these are things that we need to look after. In other words, we should not be engulfed in, in our own uh, life, in our own way of just only looking to, you know, to be s selfish. In other words, we should not be just looking after our own, but rather we should expand our horizon. We should, we should include in our care people beyond our own circumstances. Of course, starting with your own parents and your own relatives, and the circle would expand little by little to include people in the neighborhood, people in the, in the same city, people in nearby cities, people in uh, uh, you know, other areas and so on and so forth. But of course, when there is a calamity, when there is a disaster, when there is an emergency, in some place in the world, whether this is being a Muslim or not, we need to uh, go ahead and, 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 and help these people who are in dire need for our help with financial resources, with some other resources, as much as we can, because that is really is going to help us in this life as well as in the hereafter. You know, when we look at the glorious Qur'an and how the glorious Qur'an enjoins doing all the good things in life, you know, how, how interesting and how grateful the, uh, the Islamic view of people who do support other things. You know, even before Muslims got into the various duties of their own religion, there was a look after the uh, caring for the orphan, for the disadvantaged, for the people who are in need. As Allah says, for example, in Surah Al-Balad, فَلَا لا أُقْسِمُ بِهَذَا الْبَلَدُ وَأَنْ تَحِلُّمْ بِهَذَا الْبَلَدُ وَوَالِدٍ وَمَا وَلَدُ This is just only the beginning of uh, Allah swearing by Mecca as a holy place. But then, towards the end, فَلَا اقْتَحَمَ الْعَقَبَةُ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةُ shouldn't you, shouldn't you pass the obstacle, the uphill, in order to be saved? وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةَ And don't you know the matter or the value or the greatness and importance of this obstacle? Well, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةَ فَكُّ رَقَبَةَ is to free a soul, to free a slave. Uh, that is one way of doing good to people. فَكُّ رَقَبَةَ أَوْ إِطْعَامٌ فِي يَوْمٍ ذِي مَسْغَبَةَ Yatiman da maqraba. If you feed someone who's uh, despaired, someone who's really in a need of food, then, or someone who has already touched the ground from poverty and malnourishment and hunger, we know that these people do exist somewhere in the world, in uh, Africa. In some part of Asia, uh, somewhere in Latin America, there are people all over the world who are in need of the help of those whom Allah has blessed with some uh, resources, some money, some uh, ability to help. And of course, people need to stand beside each other during times of calamity in particular, but throughout the times, on a daily basis, all the time, in order for uh, Allah the Merciful to have mercy on us. Look at the hadith and the saying of the Prophet, the Prophet of Mercy, peace be upon him, as he said, مَنْ يَسَّرَ عَلَى مُعْسِرٍ يَسَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ If you ease up the condition of a Muslim who's in a hardship, Allah will make it easier for you on the Day of Judgment. And of course, the more you do to people, the more you get back, the more you earn and get for either in this life or in the hereafter. So you have the, 
both, you, you are winning either way, either in this life or in the hereafter because Allah the Almighty is so generous and He makes these things as tests for us to see how well we do in life. That's why if, we, if you have someone in your own neighborhood, someone who's in need, go ahead and check on them. Be nice, be kind, give them some time. Just like Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, the great caliph who did not uh, stay in a big palace with, uh, you know, all the guards and protection and so on. He used to go at night and check on, on people because during the day he's busy running the affairs of the state, but at night... Of course, they do, though they do help each other. All right, Suzanne, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum salam. Um, I have a question. Um, it's a scientific question in a sense. It's on frequencies. Today, um, they have scientifically proven that different frequencies can help uh, cure cancer and do different things. Now, I know that frequencies can also be used and ways that are not productive, that are non-Islamic, like in music and different things. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if we Muslims are allowed to use frequency to, for a sort of, not necessarily healing, but if it helps, can we use a frequency like medicine? Uh, when, when you say frequency, do you mean like electric shocks? Is that... No, the frequencies are sound frequencies. Sound frequencies. Yes. In in what way? Any particular sound like musical okay. instruments? Yeah. Well, and it, it's not necessarily musical. It can be put into music, which they also do, and sometimes to hypnotize people, and, and it does affect the brain and the okay. brain waves. But it's a sound frequency. Okay. All right. And they, the Buddhists actually use it when they are meditating. They do also use frequencies. And in Christianity, in the um, in the choirs, or the, they used to actually do hymns and, and religious hymns with certain mm -hmm. frequencies that would hire them to a higher level. Okay. So you're wondering how lawful this would be in Islam? Yes, I would. All right. Thank you so much, Susan. If we use it medically. Right. Right. For healing. Shukran. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. As alaikum. As wa wa well, let me stop since this is uh, something that I, I do have emails that are waiting. But since Susan has touched upon this subject, obviously what we need to learn is that we do have the glorious Quran, which is a source, which is the source of healing. And obviously we have known from studies, uh, either in the Muslim world or in uh, some other countries such as the US uh, where Dr. Ahmed Al Qadi for example has had done some tests um, regarding the use of Quran for for healing and he found interesting results where the Quran was a source of healing even to non-Muslims where they felt comfortable and they felt happy when the Quran was was being recited uh, when they when they have some difficulties and they found comfort in, in listening to the glorious Qur'an. But nonetheless, for us, of course, it's not only just a matter of uh, enjoying the recitation or the rhythm uh, of, of reciting the glorious Qur'an, but it goes beyond that, is that the Qur'an is, is a source of healing for both the heart and the mind and the soul um, and the body. All of these things, if, if anyone complaints of uh, any illness of any sort, obviously the Qur'an would be, would be a source of healing. Now that depends on how uh, strong you believe in that, because obviously, as the scholars would say, depending on how you use a sword, for example, it's not, the sword would be effective if a strong hand would use the sword in the right way. And the same thing happens with the glorious Qur'an. Well, depending on how, you know, what is being said and how these things, of course, if this sound 
involves any music or musical instrument, then obviously this would not be allowed in Islam since all the musical instruments um, are being prohibited except deaf in certain occasions, unhappy occasions such as when, when we have uh, marriage, if we have someone coming like homecoming for someone who has been away for some time, these sort of things uh, that do uh, occur, obviously this is allowed, but other than that we cannot use these all these modern uh, musical instruments. But if it doesn't involve that, and I don't know how how that affects, of course, it, it does need more explanation. I'm not aware of uh, where the effect would come from all these frequencies. Do they, for example, affect the brain? Do they, uh, do they uh, affect the, the nerves um, and the nervous system? Do they affect uh, the soul and the heart? Of course, nothing is better than than the glorious Qur'an in this regard. And of course, to use the various dua and, and supplication that the Prophet ﷺ has taught us. And that would be a source of protection and a source of curement as well. So it, it would be used for, for both uh, protection and cure. And that's why I do emphasize on that. That would we would have enough in that. But of course, if that is helpful, but... You know, uh, I think uh, you, you shed some light, Susan, on, on the use of this in, in for example, in churches and in, in, in the uh, singing of the choir and so on. We, of course, uh, don't use that. Of course, uh, our places of worship are only to, to listen to the glorious Quran, as you know, when we go to prayer and we stand behind the imam, although the imam's voice may not be uh, the best that we have in the community, but we still can uh, be influenced by the Qur'an if we understand the meaning of what is being recited and what is being said and how strongly we are related to the glorious Qur'an. So I think that would be, that would be the case there. It's just a matter of advice. And if you do have something uh, that you'd like to add and, and, and help us by sending some information and that we can, we can always look up uh, the information um, on on this particular matter um, uh, in, in particular. All right, uh, leaving what we have today uh, regarding the ease of hardships for people and helping those who are in need. Obviously, we need to be to sit together to help one another, to help all our uh, Muslim brothers and sisters, and even non-Muslims who are in dire need. That's a way of da'wah. That's a a way of approaching these people, uh, seeking Allah's pleasure, seeking Allah's reward for doing that. This is always encouraged. As I said, this was the case during the time of the uh, early uh, stages of Islam, where even before uh, prayer and, and fasting and, and uh, almsgiving or zakah and salah and siyam and all, was ordained upon Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ was asked to care for the orphan, to care for the needy, and for the hungry, and so on. That was that was the case, and we still have that principle going on. And if we are blessed with some um, provision, with some favors that Allah has given us, of course it's His trust with us, and we need to pass that on. To people, not of course distribute all what we have, but rather we pay the zakah and we give charity and we care for the people, and that would be helpful. It even protects us from falling into disasters, for example, or even be a subject of terrible uh, um, tribulations, for example. You know, the more uh, just you are, in the distribution of, of what you have, uh, obviously the more protected you are as a society from tribulations, from uh, chaos, from all the uh, turmoil that may take place in any given uh, society or, or, or nation. Uh, going to this question from Sister Amila, I think, she says, if a woman says to her husband, 
All right, let me cut this and, and take this call. Muhammad, are you there? Muhammad. Yes, my question. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Go ahead. Wa alaikum assalam. Please, um, I have a question. Yes. I am from Nigeria. Yes, uh huh. My question is. My question is. Two women were fighting. Two women are fighting. Yes. So one of them hit the stomach of the other. So the woman that his stomach was hit felt bleeding. Go ahead. Then subsequently that bleeding woman was carried to hospital. Uh huh. After of, of, uh, the doctor went through, then it was told that the, the infant died. As a result of that fighting. Okay. So my question here is What is the legal aspect of that woman who she said the stomach of her counterpart? Did she did she lose the, is, a, is did you say mis miscarriage? Yes, Thank you, sir. Muhammad, wait. Yes, the, is, 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 yes. She okay. lost she lost her child because of the fighting. Because of that heat. Okay, because yes. Because of, of that fighting. Because, okay. okay. Because of that fighting. Yes. All right. I'll answer your question, Muhammad. Thank you so much. You would like in my country. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Muhammad. Well, as you know, this is this is very, very uh, terrible to hear. I mean, this is very sad that uh, two women do fight and of course uh if they uh, if they fight uh and then one of them uh, would lose a child or have a miscarriage because of the uh of the fighting they need to go to a court i cannot decide because that has to be they have both to sit before uh, a sharia court judge and then the judge would would uh, exactly listen to both and uh, from there, the, he would he would pass pass on the um, a judgment. But of course, you know how how that would be. Of course, after listening to both sides, we cannot just judge from from. But everyone is responsible for whatever he or she does. Obviously, this is the the main principle. We know that if anyone transgresses, if anyone does something wrong or harm another human being. This person is responsible for his own actions. And he would, he would have to pay this, of course, uh, uh, he would have to pay the price for it. Now, how do we prove? You have to listen to this in a court of law. And all this would be recorded and would be listened to. And then, of course, we would uh, pass on the judgment afterwards. But that has to be referred to a judge. And not we cannot answer this just from here, because we don't know um, the situation fully with all the uh, information that is needed and, and the concerned parties. Um, going back to the idea here of uh, if a woman says to her husband that she should divorce her, is the marriage uh, already nullified or, or not valid by just uttering the words? Or should the man first agree with it, or if she did not pay the khula, is she still his wife? I hope that you'll answer me. Well, because we talked about this particular issue in the previous episode, obviously we need to emphasize the point that a woman should not push her husband towards giving her divorce. If she does without a, a strong reason, without a valid reason, then she would be deprived of Jannah. Because what we are after is 
a continuous and smooth relationship, compassion between the two uh, uh, sides in a marriage. Of course, we need to base it on something that is strong, that is good, but we need still to, of course, uh, protect it. And this, if we have our own uh, nagging style, or if we have something that comes up uh, from now on then, which will affect that marriage, we need to stop that and we need to keep that marriage intact. How do we do that? By not allowing women to ask for it, even if something happens, or when there is a crisis, when there is a fight or some something goes on because these things do come and they will go depending on how we deal with them the same thing with a with a man a man is supposed to lead um, and to head that institution of marriage with all wisdom and kindness and generosity but sometimes this doesn't happen and clashes may take place so if we always resort to divorce when there is uh, difficulties or crises in our relationship, then there would not be any marriage uh, that will last for, for long. The point is, we need to bear, we need to be patient, we need to ask Allah to help everyone. We, depending on how we act, the other side would react to our own actions. That's why we always need to take the lead, whether being a man or a woman in that relationship. And normally it does work. Sometimes we come to um, a roadblock. We come to, uh, you know, stand still or a steel, steel mate. Uh, there is no way that we can pass that relationship and therefore we need to settle it by, by divorce. But divorce should not take place when the two parties are you know, very angry, or they are just in a fight. This is going to uh, make it make it terrible. So, a woman should not ask for for divorce. But if she asks for it, and the man gives it to her willingly, without any anger that he would lose his, uh, uh, you know, ability to 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 think and to understand what he was saying then obviously, you know, this talaq or divorce would take place. And it, it's, it's going to be effective. That's why, you know, we should, they, should, they shouldn't do it. But when we come to the other thing is khula. If they agree whether the payment comes in immediately or later, of course, once the two parties agree, um, it, the khula is, is uh, effective, you know, when the payment may come in later. So the payment doesn't affect this because it will come as we, as we say. If I buy this glass with this amount of money, it's mine even if I haven't paid it yet because I may, I may be asked to pay it later or I'm just going to pay it after. Uh, be, but we, already, we already agreed on that. So that is the point there. I hope that uh, your, your question has been answered. And inshallah, we'll be back with more. So please... Stay around. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Do you like to have yourself purified, your children? obedient to you? Do you like your dua to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is obligatory for every Muslim and Muslimah to pay the nasiha immediately. That's why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he saw something wrong, he did not delay it. He issued that immediately. He turned his face to the Prophet and to the people and said, I swear by Allah that I have never ever seen a better educator or instructor than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you are the fourth person in the middle of the cave with those three people, you think that they will see the rays of the sun again? So the fruit of sincerity is that it had an impact on the people. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has a prompt result or effect on the man who's doing it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and purify our hearts and our deeds. <laughs>
you still can give your uh, own evidence and saying to the to the judge, and it will be in your favor. Thank you so much. Okay. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Hajar. Uh, let me uh, get into something here that I uh, I received in the last two weeks. Something that I uh, had so many emails from people that some I know and some I don't know, and they uh, they said that uh, the following in Germany the government started a survey to learn that Islam also should be an official religion like Judaism and Christianity. It is a pity that no votes are much more than yes votes. To make it possible for Islam to be the official religion, please cast your vote by clicking the jaw button and after that send it by clicking the zur answering button in the below given site. I don't know how these people think. I mean, First, I try to check on that whether this is being true or not, and I couldn't find anything regarding this, whether this is being true or not. That's for one thing. The other thing is, how do you act like this when, you know, I think the, the government of Germany is wise enough to say that not every Muslim is going to be counted in this particular survey if... Uh, I, I don't know how, how this is coming. Is it just only to get the opinion of people before they try to present that law in, in, in legal bodies and try to, to see whether to make the Islamic religion, um, uh, the religion of, of the, uh, I mean, an accepted and official religion. Because obviously I know there are about three and a half to four million Muslims in Germany and they can represent themselves very well in the legal bodies there. They can push forward in the parliament and other uh, institutions of decision making to say whatever they say they don't need a survey otherwise whatever you can't just like act on uh, a simple email that comes from an unknown source and they need you to uh, you know cast your vote or say no or say yes to something that you're not really aware of that's why we have some etiquettes and we have to be wise enough to act even if under goodwill, I know that these people have a goodwill to do whatever they, they wanted to do, but it was not the right way to do that. If there is something that is going on there, obviously it has to concern only Muslims in Germany and not Muslims all over. Otherwise, unless it's open, and I don't see any point of opening this to everyone because the Christians can vote, the Jews can, can, can vote, the Indians and the Hindus and whatever, the Buddhists and so on. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not the right thing to, to do in this respect. That's why I need, we need to be careful when we get things like this you know, on, the, on the internet because it is really not going to help us at all in this regard and, and we have to be very careful. Now, I do have this uh, very interesting email from uh, Salamat Bello asking about corned beef. And it says, please, I want to know if corned beef is halal or haram. Because a friend said, uh, you know, something like that. I, I, I couldn't even read the whole, because the whole email is not, is not clear. I don't know whether this is because uh, of, of the color of, uh, I don't know, yes, because of the color. And it says, because by an Islamic country, also not knowing if the Islamic way of slaughtering was followed. And uh, is it right for one to still consume such a product by saying, Bismillah before eating? Well, it comes to whether this is being corned beef or any kind of meat, whether this is frozen, canned, or fresh, and so on, it is important for us to, as you said, to make sure that the slaughtering is right and correct, because you cannot consume any meat that has been slaughtered by an unknown source, or in a non-Muslim country, where it was not um, marked as halal, because in that way, 
it has not been certified by um, uh, an authorized uh, Islamic body uh, that has actually supervised the way that was it was slaughtered and and and, and kept and and met the uh, standards for an Islamic tabiha. That's why, in this regard, I think we need to be uh, very careful. And when it comes to corned beef, I, I don't know whether uh, people are aware of what corned beef is because uh, corned beef actually is is uh, was an earlier name or process where actually it's it's not related to corn but it was like adding salt to the to the beef before uh, modern means of preserving the meat um, such as to add um, salt to it and to dry it up and to eat it at a later time. This is of course something that a lot of people do such as what we uh, do in Mina for example before the modern refrigeration. Uh, that's why the days of Tashriq for example were called as such the days of Tashriq when actually you uh, slaughter the meat and you uh, actually put them into slices you add up salt to them, expose them to the sun in order to dry up, and of course uh, the salt will prevent any spoiling um, uh, of, the, of the meat. That's why they are called the days of Tashriq, because they are the, the days when after the, the day of slaughtering on the Eid day, uh, this meat is exposed. The same idea was applied in, in the West, uh, in, in Europe and, and North America and so on, where they would uh, salt the meat and preserve it for the future, for future use. Now, uh, if uh, nothing was, first we need to make sure that um, it was done correctly, um, according to the Islamic slaughtering uh, principles, which is to uh, cut the jugular veins um, of the neck and make sure that the uh, blood uh, goes out completely and there is nothing left in the body as part of the blood. Um, that is important because we're not allowed to eat blood anyway. It's prohibited for a Muslim. Secondly, we need to make sure that nothing of the preservatives was added that is prohibited. Nothing that like uh, any uh, ingredient of, of liquor Anything that uh, is prohibited is, of course, it's not allowed. That's why if you have any doubt, just don't do it. If you, you have to, to, to look at um, what is written, especially if it's a canned food, and see whether this is a halal stamp has been put on there and it was supervised by an authorized body in the uh, manufacturing uh, company and in, in, in that in any particular country, such as Australia, um, uh, other countries where normally or Brazil or India and so on, because in these countries there are some Muslim or Islamic bodies that supervise and, and watch for uh, how meat is being, uh, is, is being of course uh, processed, beginning with slaughtering the animal and then uh, processing the food and making sure that it follows the Islamic principle. So that, that, is, that is important. And I, um, I thank you for raising uh, this particular issue. I'm so glad that we are concerned. But at the same time, when we talk about this very important topic of uh, meat and whether this is being halal or not, let me give you something um, an ex as an expansion to this idea, where actually some people eat the flesh and the meat of their own brothers and sisters and think is it, this is legal and, is, and it's allowed for them to do that. That is by backbiting and by walking with uh, fitna, as we say in ghiba and namima. Ghiba is to backbite uh, to backbite your own uh, uh, brother and sister, this is like eating their own flesh, as the Quran described for us, to make it resentful 
for us not to do it. As Allah says in, in the glorious Quran, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ So you should not backbite one another. Do you like to eat the flesh of your own uh, brother when it's like alive and it's dead, dead meat? I mean, how would you, would you like to eat a dead body of your own brother? This is exactly like that and when two women uh, uh, during fasting came to the Prophet ﷺ, they were brought to the Prophet ﷺ and they were just backbiting people. And then uh, they were fasting. They, In fact, they were not eating. And he said, come in and throw up. So what they threw from, their, from inside their, their stomachs was actually clots of blood. He said to them, It was like thick clots of blood. And this shows that, yes, it, it, it really gave the real example of how terrible it would be for someone to eat their their own their own uh, the flesh of, of their own brother. All right, Mubin, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yes, brother. Hello, friend. I, I have one question. Go ahead. Uh, for example, uh, I went to mosque in the evening prayer. For example, uh, Maghrib prayer. Yes. I missed one rakah. Then I uh, I found the second rakah. Then in the end, I will complete the remaining one rakah. Mm-hmm. So when we found the second rakah, what should I read? Should I keep on reading with Imam? Uh, Surah Fatiha, for example, or Quran. Okay. Any other question, Mubin? Yes. Any other question? No, I have another question. Okay, where are you calling from? From, from here, from Riyadh. From Riyadh. Thank yes. you so much, Mubin. Okay, okay. I'll answer your question, inshallah. Okay? Now, regarding this particular question, when we catch up, with the imam, either the second rakah or the third rakah, what should we do? Let's put it clear here that the first rakah for you is what you caught with the imam. So the second rakah of the salah with the imam is your own first rakah. And the second and the third rakah for the imam is your own second. So you need to make up the third. Don't make it like I'm missing up the first so I should act with him like I'm doing the second and the third and then I make up for the first. No. Actually, you're, you're doing continuously, you're doing the second as your own first, the third for him is your own second, and you make up, um, actually, of course, uh, uh, the third. So in this, that would be because we need to make always the prayers in uh, uh, in order now in in that respect what you should do well as you know when we when you are behind the imam you should listen to the imam while reading until the imam completes al fatiha then he would have a, a short silence a short period of silence that's when you should read your own Fatiha. Okay? All right. So let me take this call and, and come back to explain. Hanifa, assalamu alaikum. Hanifa? Alaikum, uh, salam, Sheikh. Can you, can you speak to me from, from the phone, not when you're listening to TV, please? Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, my question is uh, about the Huda TV. This is my first time to call in this uh, channel. And my question is, uh, if Huda TV can reach Philippines, especially in Mindanao, because this channel, I think this is a very helpful channel to the Filipinos in uh, Mindanao, because they can learn lots of the good things in Islam. So okay. I discovered, you know, uh, Sheikh, I discovered this Huda in uh, 1996. Since I discovered this Huda TV, 
Alhamdulillah, uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, knowledge I learned about Islam. Mashallah. So my my another question, Sheikh, is about the about the black black magic because in uh, in Mindanao, especially in my uh, in my uh, province in Mindanao, lots of uh, Muslim, but I call them as a Muslim because they they practice this kind of evil evil act. So so can you please uh, can you please give light on this? with black magic because okay. many people they learn this uh, kind of act which is i know this is satanic act okay. and that's only check all right thank you so much hanifa okay going back to mubin's question regarding what you need to do when you catch uh, when you miss some some rakahs uh, for behind the imam we should listen to the to the Fatiha and then read your own Fatiha because that is a requirement. Although there is a difference among the scholars of Islam, some are saying that you should only depend on the Imam and listen to what the Imam uh, recites without you reciting Al-Fatiha. Some are saying that you need to recite Al-Fatiha in every rakah. Well, if you are able to do it, such as if you catch the Imam already before Rukur and there is the time after he says, Waladhalin, and you say, everyone says, Ameen, then we, he waits a little, you start. Even if he starts reciting, you complete your own Fatiha, but, you know, in a normal speed, without delay, and then just listen to what the Imam is saying afterwards, what he recites. If he, uh, of course, in the third rakah, he doesn't recite loudly, so what you need to do is your own, you read your own Fatiha, and if there is time, you start a short surah until the Imam makes rukur. That's how it should be done, and uh, may Allah accept. You know, one advice here, of course, is to try to catch the Salah from the beginning. Even before the Iqama starts, you should be there in the Masjid. As soon as you hear the Adhan, and of course we have all watches and we, we know the um, beginning of the time for, for Salah, when the Adhan is, is being announced, even if you don't hear the nearby masjid making the Adhan, you should still uh, can know the, the time, you should uh, hurry up to the masjid and, and make uh, two rakahs as a greeting to the masjid, wait inside the masjid and read some of the Quran or uh, do some voluntary um, you know, uh, voluntary prayer. And then when the salah is being, uh, you know, announced for, for iqama, you're already there. And you catch up, of course, the first row. So your own reward will be even more because of this. So that is my, of course, advice for myself and for others as well. Now, Hanifa regarding the Philippines and whether this is, um, there is a, a broadcasting of Huda there. I'm not aware, but I'm, I'm sure that Huda is working hard to make the Huda uh, reception available everywhere in the world. And of course, if the people uh, there do have strong satellite system with, uh, you know, uh, good receivers, Obviously, they need a satellite, okay, to, to, to that. Okay, do I have Um Kulthum from Nigeria? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi Yes, sister. Um, please, I would ask, like to ask a question regarding um, following the imam. Um, when you meet him, um, after he had already said the first rakah, you meet him at the second rakah. Um, how would you... Uh, um, would you, after completing the second record, when he sits down to say the tahiyya, are you supposed to say the tahiyya, or you just sit down quietly until he finishes, you rise and complete? Um, I have this uh, um, confusion regarding you, like, you like say, uh, um, say, uh, um, um, three, uh, three tahiyas, like, uh, um, within the same prayer, so I'd like some clarification, please. 
Okay, so like, thank you. Are you talking about the second or the third rakah? Um, when, like when I meet him saying the second rakat, he would sit down to say the for, for the first tahiyah. Would I say tahiyah with him? Okay. Because if I say tahiyah during that, it means that I would have to say three tahiyahs within the same salah, right, like right. for maghrib or for okay. isha. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, sister. Um mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. I'll answer that question, but let me. Uh, get back to the issue of the reception, and I, uh, of course, would pass this on to the administration of Huda TV, hope, hoping that, inshallah, they would they would answer, they would uh, meet that requirement. Regarding black magic, I think I need to, to delay the um, answer to that, because they st said only I have 30 seconds to uh, for the program, so I don't have enough to talk about black magic, and I will talk about magic. And every magic is black, by the way. There is no black magic and white magic. Every magic is black. And thirdly, Um Kulthum, um, when you catch the imam uh, at the, uh, in the second rakah, for example, you should sit, you know, as the imam sits because you need to follow the imam. إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامُ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ Imam was made only to be followed according to the hadith. So you need to follow the imam, but say only the first tahiyyat, when he's in the first tahiyyat. If you are in the second one, say also the tahiyyat, which doesn't harm you because you are in dhikr and remembrance. But remember, you have to sit and say something. You cannot sit idle without saying anything. Otherwise, ideas and creeping things would come to your mind. So just busy yourself with a tahiyyat like you are doing in the, in the first tahiyyat, and then Again, with the uh, second way, third rak'ah for him, second rak'ah for you, you do the tahiyyat. Now, whether you do the, the complete tahiyyat or only the first is a difference among the scholars. Some are saying only do the first tahiyyat in the second rak'ah for you, although it's the third rak'ah for the imam. I hope I made it clear, but inshallah, we'll meet, inshallah, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the future, inshallah, next week. Until then, I leave you with Allah's care. And protection. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. I know sometimes you feel all alone. Call me anytime when you feel all the way down oh, 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 trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not My brother, it's a trial that you're going through So don't be afraid, Allah's there for you so hold on. hold on, Allah's there for you, hold on, He's listening to you, hold on.